everyone, and welcome to First Things First with Chris Carter and Nick Wright. I am Jenna Wolf. We are finally here, the start of the NBA Finals, the yes. greatest time of the year for you, Nick Wright. Probably you. Game one of the NBA Finals, game one of hopefully more than four, maybe five. Could we get to six? Is there a possibility for seven? Let's try to get to an entertaining game number one. Well, okay. okay. And then right we'll before we try to stretch there. out the, the NBA season. What's the, the point spread right now? 12. It's 12 a 12 points. point spread for Golden State in game one. Is that higher or lower than what you had originally anticipated? I mean, if you'd asked me after the, the Warriors beat the Rockets, I said their Warriors will be at least 10 point favorites. The yeah, Cavs have not done start. well in game one's the last two series against Golden State and Golden State. But we'll see what happens tonight. They got a lot going for them then. Yes, It absolutely. should be fun. All right, let's talk about it. If you are a fan of the same two teams playing four straight times, then this year's NBA Finals is for you. Cavs and Warriors tip off tonight for the fourth straight year, and while the bulk of the Warriors remain the same from years past, this Cavs team is clearly not as deep or as talented as the last few years, but Cleveland still has LeBron James, and LeBron James has proven he can single-handedly win games. Also, he kind of loves this challenge. Listen, Golden State is one of the best teams I've ever played. It's one of the best teams that's ever been assembled. Um, you know, um, and then, and then they added Kevin Durant. So what then? What does that do to him? It even makes him even more dangerous and um, you know even more powerful and great. And you know, and it's just um, it's for me as a competitor. It's just it's fun. It's it's very it's truly fun. And um, to 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 know when I'm done playing a game of basketball, to know I played against some of the greatest teams I ever played. Um, you know, you know, ever been assembled. Um, and this is one of them. All right, so, Cece, what do the Cavs have to do to have, forget win, just to have a chance in game one tonight? Well, it's nice to hear LeBron and hear him talk how he addresses the, the, the challenge. And um, LeBron's been to the finals nine times. Um, I think I'm correct in this, Nick. Only two times his team has been the favorite. They were and favored in 2011 against Dallas, and the first time they played the San Antonio Spurs, that's it. Underdogs right. every other time. And the last eight times, this is the least talented team of the last eight. All right? What LeBron did that first time with that Cavs team, them being a very, very stingy defense with LeBron James, but the last eight times, not the talent going on to the court. So LeBron has stepped up. He wants to step up to the challenge. To me, it reminds me of the days back in the playground when you had one guy who was a superstar. And I know this because my brother Butch, he's the best player in Ohio, one of the top 20 in America. And he used to go to the park, and it'd be like, okay, Butch is on one team. He'd tell the other guys, y'all select whoever y'all want. And I'll take the rest of them. And yeah. there were times where Butch would give us the business with the rest of them. And that's what LeBron James is like. He's got the players no one else wants in this series. And he's going to try to steal a couple games away from potentially the greatest basketball team, definitely the best shooting basketball team that we've seen. So he's looking forward to the challenge. Um, LeBron wants to be the greatest player ever and wants to be compared to the greatest player ever. To me, this is his greatest challenge. So how can the Cavs be competitive? Because in 2016, they won the series. They lost the first two games by a combined 48 points. In Golden State. In 2017, they lost in five. They lost the first two games by a combined 41 points in Golden State. So whether they win the series, lose the series, they've never done well. The last time they did well in a game one against the Warriors was an overtime loss the first time these two teams played. The game Kyrie Irving got hurt. So what has to happen? LeBron absolutely unequivocally cannot have a feel out game. We saw him have feel-out games in the game ones okay. of each of the three playoff feel series. Feel-out being meaning feel what the defense is See, giving you, look at what they're it, setting. Try to spend more time getting other guys involved than attacking the basket. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fall, you know, kind of reserve. If the game's starting to get away, eh, I'm going to leave something in the tank, go get him game two. Here's why I know he can't have a feel-out game. Uh, Zach Lowe wrote a great article uh, this week talking about how LeBron's playoff, playoff run up to this point giving you 34, 9, and 9 on 54% shooting might be the greatest run-up to an NBA Finals we've ever seen from any player in league history. And that's been barely enough against far inferior teams. 
So think about that. The greatest individual run has barely been enough against teams that are nowhere near as good as Golden State. So mm-hmm. the first baseline minimum is LeBron's got to have at least – a 30-point triple-double type of performance, maybe a high 30-point performance. If you're not going to get the triple-double, a 40-point performance. That's how they stay Mm -hmm. competitive. And then after that, you start asking, can the Cavs get some stops? Do they have anyone to match up on Kevin Durant? Are they going to be asking LeBron to do that offensively and guard Kevin Durant for 30 minutes? Yes. Because you think they are. Well, you have to. I don't know about 30 minutes, but... The way the lineups are set, if they're going to play Tristan Thompson and if Kevin Love is healthy, that that allows Kevin Love to not be exposed on the defensive end as far as guarding Looney or Draymond. Neither one of those players, Draymond barely getting in double figures, not shooting the ball, not playing with a lot of confidence. And, and, and LeBron's got to guard KD. Now, to me, that adds to the legacy of who he is, regardless of how the finals is played out. How does LeBron do head-to-head versus KD? Is Kevin Love the only second option? Do you see any scenario by which, I don't know, JR, who's been invisible, CC, two years ago, he came out and played lights out in the finals. Is there any other second option that LeBron has besides Kevin Love? Um, I got blind faith for LeBron. I, I can't appropriate that faith to any of the other Cavs. I mean, Kevin Love, can Kevin Love, we've dropped our standards so much on Kevin Love, Kevin Love, can he play? Um, can he get 15 and 10? He was a 25 and 12 guy. Now we're asking for 15 and 10. I haven't seen a two guard that has the type of talent of JR or have the resume that's gone a complete about face and not be able to find the basketball. JR in Boston averaged two points as a shoot. In on, Boston. Yeah, two points. He made and, six shots in the four games. In I mean, Jen, he's averaging one more point than me and you. I mean, like, <laughs> I, I mean, as a shooting guard, when LeBron has needed the most help, everyone know he needs help, and it's a healthy. It's not as if he's struggling with some type of injury. So, if Golden State, if any of the top three players, maybe not Clay, but if Steph or KD are on the Pacers. I don't believe the Cavs are here. So when you talk about this historic run that LeBron has been on and it barely got him through, the team he's facing in Golden State is one of the all-time great teams. All right, so I'm going to throw a wrinkle out there, assuming Kevin Love's playing tonight. If Kevin Love's not playing tonight, it's a whole other set of issues. But let's assume he clears the concussion protocol and he is able to play tonight. What if you almost try to bait the Warriors into going with mismatches to their worst players. And by that, I mean this. What if you don't start Tristan Thompson? What if you start Kevin Love at the five, Jeff Green at the four, LeBron at the three, and then JR and George Hill? And we say, you know what? Kevin Love, you're guarding Kevon Looney. And the Warriors, guess what? You can get Kevon Looney post-ups as much as you want. That then allows Jeff Green to guard Durant and LeBron to guard Draymond. And if the Warriors are going to beat you by Kevon Looney having 28 points, you'll take it. Like, and then maybe you can stretch the floor and offense a little bit more. Now, that takes Tristan out. That takes your energy guy out. That takes your only rim protector out. There, is, there are no great options here. But I would be doing different things to where I am trying to – my number one goal as a Cavs defense is don't let Steph and Clay get off the way. They, I've never seen the Warriors – let me put it like this. I cannot remember a game where the Splash Brothers look like the Splash Brothers and the Warriors lost. I've seen Kevin Durant go for 37 and the Warriors lose. Happened game two against Houston. Like, I've seen games where the Warriors dominate you down low and somehow lose. I can't remember a game where Steph and Clay are going Steph and Clay Mm -hmm. and the Warriors don't end up winning that game. So I I think Ty Lue, this is a hell of a task for him, trying to find what what Ty Lue needs is to be able to play with six guys. Because then it's like, oh, we'll have this guy on the offense, mm-hmm. this guy on defense. You can't do that. So you're going to have to – there are no great options. You're going to have to pick your best of some bad options. One thing I worry about, I worry about because people haven't talked about him, I worry about Clay Thompson and worry from a how do the Cavs hold him down. Because Jr. has not played really well on the offensive end. Clay, because they have George Hill and um, Jr. as the backcourt, Clay doesn't have to exert the type of energy that he would typically have to in a series like this. He was guarding Kyrie the last three years. So he's relieved. So Clay, it might be hard to keep him from scoring 30 points. So monumental task by the um, the Cavaliers coming out, but that a first initial. We always talk about that third that third quarter, but that a first initial first quarter. 
Are the Cavs still within reach after the first quarter? The big question mark in tonight's game. All right, we'll take a break there. Coming up, more about LeBron. Will he even consider the Philadelphia 76ers in free agency with what's happening with the Brian Colangelo situation? That's next. First things first. New topic now. As of this morning, Sixers GM Brian Colangelo still has a job. This after a report from The Ringer that he used five separate burner accounts to attack players on his roster, including Joel Embiid and Markel Fultz. Colangelo claims, quote, someone's out to get me. This is clearly not me. And now a new report that Colangelo's wife has the phone number associated with three of the five burners. Lots of process here. Nick, should the Sixers' young core want Colangelo gone? Because this is what it really comes down to. Whether he has the job or not, do the players that he has there trust him? And this is a super important offseason. They absolutely need him. All right, so I... Or need someone I've, in position. I've been following this story, story as closely as you can because I find it fascinating. Yep. And it's confusing. The, the local Philadelphia blog crossing broad overnight did some one of their own investigations about some comments that have been left for the last couple of years on newspaper articles that seem to be tied to some of these same Twitter users with inside information on Philadelphia, inside information on Toronto, which is, of course, where Colangelo was. Now there's the association with uh, reportedly the wife's phone number. It, there's no way to read this situation to me as anything other than this was Colangelo doing the tweeting or someone doing the tweeting on his behalf with his in knowledge. cahoots with his knowledge and with information. Because the information, the came information from him. came from him. Like the wife doesn't work for the team, and the, 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 there's inside information there. So, I I couldn't trust him. If I were these guys, I mean, one of these tweets is to Ben Simmons. I almost thought it was CeCe's burner account. It said, shoot, shoot the three, you coward. And that was the player he was nicest to on these, or whoever was Wait, he went after Ben Simmons to. and Joel Embiid. No, no he went after stars. Fultz and Embiid. He, oh, no, you're right. You're correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. He went after Simmons and Embiid. And so the he, he talked about Fultz's situation with his family. He talked about Jaleel, or whoever tweeted, talked about Jaleel for his medical situation. So I just, if I'm one of these players, I can't trust the guy. I can't trust the guy with information, and and this is maybe just as damaging. I can't trust the guy that what he tells me is the truth. Because he wasn't communicating these things, or whomever wasn't communicating these things when he met with these guys one-on-one. -on -one. So a long way to answer your question, no, I wouldn't want him as my GM. I wouldn't want him to control my basketball destiny. Um, the players is, is, is one set of, of issues that the owner, because to me it's about the owners, all right? Because the owner owns the team. The GM, he don't work for the players. He works for the owner. So is the owner comfortable moving forward where you have a franchise that we know where the 76ers have been the last five years, ten years, and you are on the verge of potentially doing something special. Now, as an owner, do you want to move forward and this could be a stumbling block to you improving. Because, see, I don't see the roster improving with Colangelo still staying there on the roster because I believe it will potentially affect free agents and there's too much smoke for him to be cleared of all this. Now, they're going to do an investigation. The man right now, he's innocent until proven guilty. But, I mean, he's got a couple incriminating things, the phone number and other things that are hard to explain. When you're dealing with technology, there's always some type of fingerprint, all right? So, to me, I don't believe he's going to be able to go unscathed in this. The owner, there's no way the owner would want to trust him moving forward because it would affect the players. And if I'm in the locker room and if he said something about me, I want it investigated and if he did do this, I want him fired sure. immediately. The type of information that he put out there about players, their personal, their, their medical history. And, you know, he knows better. I mean, he's been around basketball his whole, whole life. life. And, and a lot of people would say he's been very privileged. He's gotten a lot of jobs potentially because of his dad. And this right here, um, this right here, I believe, will end his basketball career as far as the NBA executive. But, Nick, it's not just about the players in that locker room. It's 
other potential free agents that could come there. It's other general managers that are, are going to be having conversations with him about what they're going to do. It's this it's, team it's going into the most important offseason, arguably, of its history that, with a guy like LeBron James looming. And listen, and let, let's just say today LeBron came out and announced, I'm going anywhere but Philly, or LeBron announced, I, I'm opting into my deal in Cleveland. This would still be an enormous offseason for Philadelphia because as we've discussed before, it, it's too complicated to get into it because of how their contract and their young players' extensions kick in. The offseason where they can most easily add a max free agent is right now. Mm -hmm. And if they don't do it right now, they are going to be hard-pressed to do it without dealing one of those assets. So even if LeBron's off the board, even if LeBron says I'm staying or going it's, to Houston, there's Paul George out there. Yes. There's, I, Boogie Cousins isn't a fit, but there's other guys. There's other ways you can improve your basketball team. Yeah, potentially there's, you could trade for Kawhi Leonard. Exactly right. Like, and so, And let's talk about the trade for Kawhi Leonard for a second. You think Greg Popovich right now would feel comfortable discussing that with Brian Colangelo. Do you think if... if, if, if no. The, no shot. Right, Absolutely. If, if the Spurs, Where Pop is right now as far as information stuff being leaked out, dealing no with more stuff than he... Yeah, right now, no. There's no way Pop would want to deal with that. So how can you do your job? Like, that's the thing is, you, it is a relationship and trust job yes. in addition to player evaluation. And I, I, I mean, I, I expect Philadelphia to do the right thing, a thorough investigation, but they're against the clock. As far as free agency, they can't take their time. Like, they have to make up their mind, is he the guy to move forward with? And they have to be able to do something with the players because, man, LeBron going to call one of the guys on the team. All right? When the ownership call him, LeBron's just going to call the guys on the team. You know, he's got relationship with those guys, and he's going to find out what the real deal is. And you don't want that information to linger on and, and have LeBron make a decision absent of them making a decision on Colangelo's future. But just think about it. If you're at a job and your boss reportedly said something about you to the world and it's out there, mm -hmm. you could say all you want, well, you know, he's innocent until proven guilty. But it's out there, you hear it, and that's just the way the world works. Like, it's sitting in that well, locker room. And I, because the sensitive information, some stuff, it's not just Jaleel Okafor's alleged failed physical, it's stuff about Markel Fultz's family that Markel Fultz didn't want public knowledge didn't well they like that only people in tight NBA circles knew right also the thoughts that he potentially faked his injury right there's that there, <laughs> there's so many things there that even if the result of this investigation is his wife went rogue I think it's still fireable because she has to it, find out she, somehow and even if it was just man I share things I think we all share things like with our spouses that are not, we don't expect to ever get out there Sometimes it's not your fault, but I, I think that's the least likely of the it scenarios. Is. But I, I want to add one other thing that I said yesterday on the show that I think is important. Sometimes you don't want to fire a GM before your biggest offseason because who are you going to hire? Like, you got a big offseason. we got these free agents to go after. The Cavs didn't bring back David Griffin. They didn't have, a, they didn't have someone in place. They tried to hire Chauncey Billups. They couldn't hire Chauncey Billups. They, it ended up leading to the Kyrie Irving trade. You have a great GM in the waiting in David Griffin. I, oh, I thought you were going to say Sam Hinkie. No, not Sam. Oh, I mean, <laughs> Sam Hinkie, that's interesting. Bring right. back the process. But you have David Griffin sitting right there who LeBron likes, who is well-respected in the league, and who's been waiting for the right job. Philadelphia is an attractive job. Yeah, but you have to do the investigation. You have to be fair to him. You got to make sure to clear everything up so that you can move forward with these superstar players. All right, we'll break there. Talk more about this coming up. Steph Curry's got some words for the haters out there next up. First things first. NBA Finals Game 1 tonight. Andre Iguodala's on leg contusion has not improved, and the former Finals MVP will not be on the floor, though he says he's not that far away. Chris, how big of a blow is this for the Warriors? Well, it's not a big blow because they got so much more talent th than the Cavs. Like, I was more concerned with the Houston. Like, if they would have lost to Houston, this would have been one of the reasons why his absence mm -hmm. Um, what he can do, his overall versatility, and some of the pressure that he relieves from other players like Clay and KD, especially on the defensive end. His versatility, it's priceless. So he's not going to be missed in this series. Yeah, listen, I, th he's their fifth most important player. Uh, if the biggest injury you deal with in a four-year run in, in the NBA Finals is your fifth most important player, you're going to be okay. And I know there's this narrative out there that he is this LeBron James stopper in the Finals. LeBron in the Finals is, is in the last three years has averaged 33, 12, and 9 on nearly 50% shooting. So I haven't seen the evidence of that anyway. 
Moving on, many agree that the aforementioned LeBron James carried a subpar Cavs supporting cast to the NBA Finals, but don't ask Warriors head coach Steve Kerr. Kerr said, quote, we know what these guys can do. You don't get to the finals with one man, no matter how good that one man is. What are your thoughts, Nick, on Steve Kerr's comments? If he means it literally, as if, if it was just LeBron James taking the court one on five, then I agree. They would have fared a little worse against Boston. If he means it figuratively, he's, he's wrong. Like, we, we, this is as much a, you don't win the finals with just one guy, but LeBron showed over the last six weeks, you can get there with just one guy showing up. Uh, LeBron James, come on. It's been the most, I think the most spectacular spectacular year of his career now I understand Steve Kerr this is the whole theory every player all the coaches are saying this because that's what they're just trying to get through this series and also they want to put more validity on the potentially on their third championship oh this is a great team over there exactly. oh they got a bunch of guys helping right. them yeah stop it exactly but that's right. when I should have used the Pinocchio nose <laughs> yes Ooh. yeah exactly right. I got to get my emojis together Tiger Woods <laughs> is back well he's back on the course at least he tees off at the Memorial Tournament in Dublin Ohio at 8:26 a.m. CC what are your thoughts on Dublin and also what do you expect from Tiger? one of my favorite golf courses in the world. I was invited to play in the Pro-Am, but Jenna, I turned down the money and the opportunity. To stay with me? Uh, well, to stay here. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I love that golf course. Uh, it's a great Jenna. tournament. Tiger Woods has won it five times before. Wouldn't be surprised at all if Tiger got into contention for the weekend. If he can get into the top five on Sunday, he can get his first win in a couple this years. Is, this is what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that sometime this weekend I got the same phone call that I got from Chris Carter a few weekends ago, which is, Nick, wake up. I know you are out last night. Wake up. Tigers six under through eight holes like you did in the last tournament mm -hmm. he played in. I uh, Come on. I, get a win, Tiger. It's a tournament he has great success at. Get a win, Tiger. All right, finally, moving on. Le'Veon Bell isn't the only big-time star causing issues at OTAs. The other two members of the Steelers trio were also not in attendance. Ben Roethlisberger attended the first day and hasn't been there since. And Antonio Brown made it to day two before taking leave. Cece, what are your thoughts on Ben and Brown's absence? See, now, Did I, Antonio criticize El Bell for not being there? Oh, tell me he can get things done. <laughs> you know, he can get more things done if you negotiate if you're here. <laughs> Okay, got it. And Antonio's got got the contract, right? Yes. He's the highest paid receiver in the league. Yes, he got he the He showed money. up for a couple days. Yeah, a couple yeah, days. And then he's it. like, I'm good. Guest appearance. I, I don't have too contract. much to get done. And I know you've talked, Antonio's a hard worker, so he's not, I'm sure he's not just on beach somewhere, but it's still interesting time. No, no, no. He is a hard worker, but this is kind of the, the dysfunction that goes along with the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, one day you got a star player saying, hey, man, L. Bell, one of the reasons why, you know, he's not getting the contract he's because he's not here. He's not around. But they've been missing OTAs for years. It's not like they've been Tom Brady, like Big Ben, like Big Ben's one of the hardest workers ever in the history of sport. Absolutely not. But they've been successful with this dysfunction as a family. Coach Mangini <laughs> told us different families got different rules. This is what they do in Pittsburgh. But what it does is it puts a strain on the other players. When you're trying to tell them that everything is important and your star players aren't bought into Oh, it's voluntary, but it's not mandatory. So it becomes you have a double standard that you start to set amongst the players. Now, Pittsburgh, they've been able to function around that. But I tell you guys all the time, when you start getting December and January, these are the types of things that come out in the game of the team not being connected. Doesn't Pittsburgh have a new offensive coordinator? Yep. Like, isn't it partly because Big Ben didn't like Todd Haley? Like, do you think the new offensive coordinator would like to have Big Ben there? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I would imagine he does. I, in general, unless there are extenuating circumstances, I try not to criticize guys for not showing up to the voluntary portions of the workouts because they negotiate in the CBA, they're not mandatory, and in the media too often we treat them as if they are. But there are extenuating circumstances for both of these players. In A.B.'s case, it's what we talked about. He spoke out about El Bell not being there. If you're going to do that, you need to be there. And in Big Ben's case, it's the whole Mason Rudolph stuff. You can't go on the radio and disparage the guy, in my eyes, lot, misrepresent what the guy said about your guy's relationship, then try to clean it up and say, oh, of course I'll help. I remember how guys helped me. And then show up to one day of OTAs and not be there to help. Like, you think Mason, I know Mason Rudolph now, I guess, gets more reps. Like, and Josh Dobbs is maybe the guy who benefits from this the most, who's trying to make the roster. But the, you, 
isn't it better for Mason Rudolph for Big Ben to be there? Of course Can't he is. learn more with Big Ben there? Like, that's the part of this that – and if you're going to skip it, I don't understand the showing up for one day. Like, And quarterbacks are held to a different standard. Like, it, it's one thing for a lot of guys not to be there, certain guys not to be there. Mm -hmm. Your franchise quarterback, your Super Bowl winning quarterback, after the, the comments he's made this offseason, that's what rubbed me the and wrong way. And especially after the, the new offensive coordinator. It becomes very important because how's he going to communicate, even if he's going to run the same exact system – his voice in your ear, which is going to be totally different to Big Ben, he should be there getting this offseason work. I believe the OTAs are important. I believe they're just as important as all the other things. Running in the offseason, lifting weights, going to training camp, all these things are essential in keeping your development and staying on top of your development as a pro football player. So where do you both fall on Levy and Bell not being there? I mean, we knew he wasn't going to be there. Right. No, guys don't have contracts. They shouldn't be there because if they get hurt, like, they're, they are not – they don't have the long-term commitment and the guaranteed dollars. They should not be there until they have to be there. Right, because the training camp, we have seen at least four players that have suffered season in injuries just in the OTA. So if you have a contract, you should be at camp at OTAs. Well, if you don't have a contract, you certainly shouldn't be there. If you do have a contract, I think you would prefer guys be this there. This is typically. the thing. I, I do understand certain guys. You reach a certain point if you've been inside an offense. Before Mark Ingram Jr. got, got suspended and the, 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 we got knowledge of that, he wasn't going to be at the OTAs because – He's been in the same system with Sean Payton. He wanted to work on some other conditioning things, some explosive things, some sprinting things that the staff of the Saints, they don't provide that type of, of, of exercise or that type of training regimen. So there are examples. Tom Brady, at this point in his career, he's got the same coordinator. They're running the same stuff. Where he is as far as trying to recharge his, his battery, I understand. So it's not just etched in stone. Every player that has a contract should be there. No, you have to have some flexibility because you know you're going to have circumstances that might you might have to extend it just a sure. little bit players understand that but just unexcused absences where a b and ben are with this team i expect it because i've seen it their whole career and i've seen it come out of pittsburgh all right let's break there let's get back to some basketball now the nba finals if you had money on the warriors winning it all before the start of the season congratulations you're not a big risk taker <laughs> if you had money on me understanding that action now that's a risk mm -hmm. despite, but despite many tutorials but despite that and despite entering the season as favorites to win it all and despite having debatedly two of the top three players in the nba four straight nba finals appearances Still impressive. Also appearances. Here's Steph on the journey this season. This year's been interesting with ups and downs and injuries and uh, even in the playoffs as of late, you know, having how we started games, um, coming out, out of the gate slow and, and fighting our way back in the second half. Um, all that stuff is, is just a part of continuing to grow um, and, and find you know, ways to motivate yourself but stay, stay appreciative of the moment, of the moment because – I think that you saw that on all our faces after game seven of, of, of the Houston series where, you know, this means a lot to us. And, and there's an appreciation for the, the difficulty to get back to this stage, let alone, you know, try to win four more games and win a championship. So we're, we're, we're living in the moment. All right, Nick, let's talk about how impressive this feat is getting to the NBA Finals four straight times. I, this, my answer may surprise you guys here, but – I find this wildly impressive. I understand they're the most talented team ever. I understand they added Kevin Durant. But I am enough of a student of NBA history. I watched a Laker team with Shaq and Kobe in their primes. Three straight NBA championships get bounced in round two. I watched a Piston team go to three straight NBA finals, get swept before they got back to a fourth. They, you want to go all the way back to the 71 Lakers. They lose in the conference finals after going to three straight NBA finals. It is hard to get to four straight. There's a reason why Magic's Lakers did it once. Bird's Celtics did it once. LeBron's franchise unto himself did it once in Miami and now once in Cleveland. And now these guys. And that's it in the last 60 years of NBA history. And they haven't done it without being on the brink. They had to play three consecutive elimination games to get to their second NBA Finals, including a Game 6 on the road against OKC before they had Kevin Durant. 
They had to play back-to-back -back elimination games, including a Game 7 on the road, to get to their fourth straight NBA Finals. Like, I do not take this for granted. I might not love the way the Warriors constructed their team. I might not love some of the personalities on that team. But to get here when I doubted if they could. I talked about all year long how hard four straight is, how the injuries can catch up. And that's one of the one other thing I'll say is I give them credit. They've stayed healthy. That's hard, man. Some of that's luck, but some of that's a skill. And their ability to have essentially their entire team intact this time of year, every year, is very impressive to me. So I give them a ton of credit for this. I would say I'm not as impressed as with you because to me it's not four years in a row making it to the finals. It's two different stories. All right? You have the Warriors, the first edition, and that got to the finals, won. Next year came back. Best record in the NBA, 73 wins. NBA record, but blue a championship to the Cleveland Cavaliers, up three to one. Oh, uh, you know, so what they do? They went out and got the second best player in the world. So for me, they haven't been to four straight with Kevin Durant. They went to two. They had a great collection of players, one of the best collection of players we've seen. Then they went out and got the second best player available. And with Kevin Durant, they've gone to two straight. I don't I haven't been that impressed with it. They went seven games. One time in this last two years with Kevin Durant, they weren't pushed last year in the playoffs at all. They got pushed one time this year in, in the playoffs. So to me, it's not as impressive because of when they went out and got Kevin Durant. If they had done this without Kevin Durant, oh, this would be, this would be one of the, probably the most impressive things that I've seen in the NBA in the last 30 years. But when you go out and get KD, when you were already a 73-win team, you didn't get an old, washed-up KD like a lot of these other great teams tried to do. They tried to retread the tires on other great Bring players. Carl Malone, that, Gary Payton. Yeah, but no, the they went out and got the second-best player in his prime. So I'm not overly impressed with four years in a row, because it's really about two and two. Were you more impressed, though, with the, the Warriors' run-up this year than last year? I know you think that this past year was a little harder. It's hard to refocus. It's hard to get the energy up, even if you have Kevin Durant. But comparing last year with Durant and this year with Durant, which was a more impressive oh, and I harder think last, year? I think last year. I, well, more impressive and harder are different things. I, last year, the way to bring him in, to make that work almost instantly, and to – Sweep round one, sweep round two, sweep round three, and then go up 3-0 in, in the NBA Finals. Yeah. San Antonio without their best player, New Orleans without their second best player, and no bench. You're talking about this year? Yes. Th th this so year, because this year was harder, isn't that more impressive? I, I don't make it harder just because they went seven games. I said it to be easier. The, San Antonio didn't have Kawhi, all right? New Orleans didn't have Boogie. Now, if they had, if they had all those players – and they had gone through that gauntlet, I would have been like, man, that's that's massively impressive. I the the reason that this year in particular, I the I, I'm not giving them as much credit as last year is also because I just I don't like teams in general that punt on a regular season. And I that's one of the reasons why people think because I lived in Houston for four years, that's why I wanted the Rockets to win. I wanted the Rockets to win because I wanted the regular season to be meaningful. It's one of the reasons I thought the Chris Paul injury was so devastating. Like the Warriors were going to have to pay the bill that was due for punting on the regular season. But they were, whatever my feelings on it are, they were an elimination game down 17 in the first quarter, down 10 at halftime. They blew the Rockets out in game six. They were in an elimination game down 11 at halftime, they blew the Rockets out in games. They didn't blow the Rockets out, but they ended up winning game seven. Like, I give them credit for it. It's hard to do in the league. Like, so you're right, see, that they, it's not the same iteration team. It's not, it's not like Shaq and Kobe's Lakers where it was, for all intents and purposes, the yes. same guy. Shaq and Kobe's Lakers didn't go add Tracy McGrady, you know, halfway through, and then it's like, hey, this is what we've got. I get that part of it, but it's still hard, man. And I... And the mental and physical fatigue of playing this many consecutive 100-game seasons, I don't think can be discounted. Yeah, now I disagree as far as the regular season. I don't think the regular season is that important. You know the reason why? Because I saw a higher seed in the Eastern Conference have home court advantage, and it didn't help. LeBron James went to Boston, Swept. won that. In the West, what happened? 65-win team, only happened 20 times. Houston was now one of those teams that didn't win the championships. 15 of those teams had won a championship. Houston won 65 games. It didn't matter. Game number seven, people talk about Chris Paul and all that. Golden State did win that game. So both teams went on the road, and I have seen Cleveland not only this year, but the previous two seasons the regular season it didn't matter that much so I'm in disagreement with you as far as the regular season yeah. because the way I've seen it play 
Cleveland, oh, man, y'all go ahead and have that. One seed, ah, y'all can have that. We'll be a number two. This year, ah, we'll be a number four. We saw Golden State this year as a number two, still reaching it to the, reaching the finals. So the regular season, I believe, with the NBA, unless they shorten the schedule, unless they take enough 15 games off the schedule, 10 games off the schedule, which would make it more important at 82 games, if you get in the tournament, you got a chance. Let's talk some football. Let's do that. Let's put basketball aside for just a second. Coming up, Peyton Manny has thoughts on Andrew Luck. Hear from him next on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. We're now joined by Super Bowl champ Chris Canty. Chris, good morning. Thanks good for morning. joining us. Good morning, We got to get all this basketball out of the way so we can focus on football. No, get you we gotta, super listen, super. listen, it's the NBA Finals. Everybody's looking forward to the matchup. You got the best player in the world all going right. up against a historically great team. So what's wrong with that? They're trying you go. to get you excited. That's that that sounds like we're, we're lucky dreams. if it goes five games. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh. We're lucky if it goes five I games. I see them. You don't see that you, one game is all you got in winning? Well, I, I mean, listen, I, I, they I, only won one game last year, and they're a worse team than they were. They don't have Kyrie, so I mean... Hey, listen, save this for Humpty and Canny on the radio. We're going to oh, talk about you. Oh, no, we're, we're leading with Yankees with Humpty Oh, okay. Oh, of course. Yankees. It is New now. York City. All right. Right. Here, yeah. though, we're going to talk some football. I feel like we're in the same position we were in last year with Andrew Luck. Still nursing his shoulder injury. Still high hopes he's going to be ready to go this season. But last year, he wasn't ready to go, and he was shut down for the year. This year, well, he's got high hopes again. Former Colt Peyton Manning weighed in, quote... I like to get all the reps in practice. It took me a few games before I felt like I was coming back. Getting as many reps as possible is key. I'm not so sure if that's advice or not, but that's what worked for Peyton Manning. Chris Candy, how important is it for Luck to get back to throwing? I think it's important for Luck to get back to a point where he trusts his body to do what his mind is going to ask him to do on the football field. And if you look at Peyton Manning's commentary around it, he talked about having 10,000 reps and, and making sure that you get the first hit out of the way, the first comeback route out of the way, the first deep pass outside the numbers out of the way, the first two-minute drive. Those are things that are important for the psychology of a player coming back from a major injury we've both been there CC done that you know how important it is to just get a feel back out there when you're on the field with your teammates but the biggest thing for me with Andrew Luck in the Colts is that they surround him with an offensive line and a supporting cast that can prop him up I mean they've asked Andrew Luck to do way too much ever since they drafted him back in 2012 when you look at what they've done since then in the draft it's basically franchise malpractice. I mean, they bought the house without the homeowner's insurance. They've only taken one offensive lineman in the first four years of his career with a high pick, which is second round or better. So the fact that they've addressed it, they drafted Ryan Kelly a few years ago. They'll get him back from injury. They drafted Quentin Nelson out of Notre Dame this year. That's going to help. They're going to fortify that guard center guard combination to go along with Anthony Costanzo at the left tackle. It's going to be a much better offensive line, arguably the best offensive line that Andrew Luck has had since he's been in the NFL. So I think that's where it starts for me for this Colts team to get back to success and Andrew Luck to get back to playing the level of football that we want him to see yeah, from him. Uh, Canty makes some, some good points. And, and I, I think as, as a fan, you need to realize how important the psyche of an athlete is. Even though he might be great or might have been great, what he has done of late will be on his mind. It's no different than Steph Curry when he was in a shooting slump. I'm sure he was shooting thousands of balls on, off the, out, out of the game. And then until it went in in the game, that's when it finally clicked. And what Peyton is talking about, because people forget, Peyton missed the whole year. So he understands what Andrew is getting ready to go through. So he's talking about that positive of knowing, I got my fastball. I can fire it in an 18-yard comeback. I can put some loft on it, cover two, if they go down the sideline or go down the middle. If I get a blitz read, someone out of the um, out of the middle of the defense, I can throw to my back. I know all these things that I've done before, but I haven't done them lately. Man, sports is about repetition, 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 so much that when you get under the gun that you can repeat what you've done in practice. That's what it's all about. And Peyton, no one has mastered that better than him. So his information, he's spot on as far as Andrew Luck. And Canty is even more spot on because he'll get his confidence throwing the ball back. But them first couple games, man, I can't get hit, and I can't get hit flush in the face because that is what he's used to. We have to introduce Andrew Luck to a different type of football. The way we take care of Aaron Rodgers, the way Brady is taken care of, and the way they took care of, of Peyton Manny when he played quarterback. Here's my biggest concern, and it's something to be totally candid. You've taught me. 
which is no matter how great of an athlete you are, no matter how established you are, practice really matters. This is one of the first major arguments we got in on the show was nine months ago. It's one of the huge misunderstandings for people. Yes, that didn't play. And, and I hate to say no, it. No, you're right. The it, people who don't play. Yes. A hundred percent. This is this is an athlete. Now, they go to work every day, Correct. and they realize the repetition of doing their job also with their skill level, that's what makes you great at doing something. But when you look at athletes, you're like, ah, just go out there. I, I just, well, and, and the reason, I'll, I'll just One of Nick, tell me your theory about well, training I, I had said, I had uh -oh. said this is one of our big first arguments was that if I had a team that didn't have a new coach, first didn't fight, I didn't divorce him, no. Didn't, didn't have a new coordinator, I would take my top 20 guys on both sides of the ball and say, training camp and preseason, we're, we're, we're doing meetings and walkthroughs. Mm. I'm going to use tra that time for the bottom half of my roster. So he's going to make it. That way, even if I'm rusty, I'm going to come out of training camp healthy. And Chris's big point was, man, these guys got to keep getting better. They got to keep practicing. And you're right. It was an athlete, non-athlete thing where I think a lot of fans look at it and say, you practice to get to the NFL. Once you get there, you've mastered it. Then you're just fine tuned. That's when the practice As, just starts. Right. And I'm so telling that, you. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling and you. so it was just a fundamental misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So that's a big lead mm -hmm. up to this. Yeah. I know Peyton missed a year. Brady missed a year. Man, Andrew Luck had surgery in January of 17. It is almost June of 18. We're talking about, what is that, 18 months? 19 months since he's been able to actually full throated practice football, what's the rust factor of that? How big of a deal is that long of a layoff? It is, it's not just, I, I, Peyton Manning had major neck surgery and missed less time. Less time. Tom Brady had his knee blown out, yep. missed far less time. How, how much of a rust factor is the concern to you? It's got to be huge. I mean, there's only one way to really get used to or get acclimated yeah. to doing football There's things. There's only way to, get, that's one just way playing, to get better at football. That's just football, playing football. Like, you can do all of the off-season drills, the conditioning and strength work with the, with the strength coaches at the facilities, but you got to go through the OTAs, the mini camps, and then when you get to training camp, putting the pads on and get used to that because it's a different kind of grind and it's a different demand physically on your body. So, Andrew Luck has got to check all of those boxes going through those different phases of the off-season program, and it sounds like he's going to start throwing the football a little bit after the start of June, somewhere in the middle of June in the beginning of training camp, he's going to start throwing the football. But he's got to start checking all of those boxes throughout this offseason to make sure he's on track to be available for his team in the regular yes, season. Yes, I agree, I agree with Chris. There are some things that he's got, some major steps he's got to get through, and throwing the football and starting in June is not the best way. I but, heard it's even a little later. Like I was, I read July even. What well, they're saying between the, between the actually, middle of June yeah, and, the, and the beginning of training camp. But I remember Drew Brees when he injured his shoulder. When he was going to New Orleans, the reason why I believe Drew Brees, not only because his overall work ethic, he's one of the hardest workers, but he has a pure throwing motion. Andrew Luck has a pure throwing motion. The reason why Mel Kuyper said the things about Andrew wasn't only his brain, his IQ, but it was his throwing motion. So that, I don't believe, would have been affected by the injury. So I have more confidence because it's the same motion that he's trying to. He just needs strength. He needs the muscle memory. He needs the reps of being on the field. But if he didn't have that pure, if he wasn't a pure thrower of the football, I would be more concerned about accuracy, more concerned about velocity. So that was going to be my question, is getting on the same page with receivers he hasn't really thrown the ball to and where accuracy falls into that because he can get a million reps and he can get his shoulder strong and he can throw and he can lift and all of it but he's got to be in a game situation and start throwing to some of these guys well, long passes short passes all well, over the field what's that time frame well stars? there's I, and I would imagine Jenna there's also one of the things that made Andrew Luck special was and it was maybe also one of his weaknesses was a fearlessness yes sir to at, not only fearlessness to take hits but also I can fit a this ball. A ruggedness. Right, a ruggedness, yes. and I can rip it. Like, mm -hmm. I can fit this ball in there. And that is, on the shoulder injury, I would think, you make fun of me, but as, you know what I mean? Like, the, about my shoulder surgery. It was nothing like this, and it took forever to recover mm -hmm. from, and I didn't have to throw a football. Like, the, the ability to trust your arm and to trust that I can do it with the same velocity and the same almost violence of it and, and have the same results. It's going to be gradual. It's not going to yes. be a situation where he's going to come back and it's going to be the Andrew Luck that we saw earn that contract that he got mm -hmm. when he's making $23 million 
million plus a year. It's not going to be that. If you look at what happened with Tom Brady and Peyton Manning, they had solid seasons coming off of those major injuries after they missed the full season. But that second year removed from that injury, they were that much better. You're talking about MVP caliber right. with both of them. So that's what you're going to have to look for from Andrew Luck. But Jenna, to answer your question about being able to fit passes into tight windows, quarterbacks will have the ability to be more accurate if they have more time in the pocket and the offensive line keeps them clean. Right. So that, for me, is where it starts with Andrew Luck. Making sure that the Colts offensive line protects him and the supporting cast does enough where they're not asking him to put the whole franchise on his back. Kind of like what the Cleveland Cavaliers are asking LeBron James to do. Oh, way to bring it full circle. Speaking of yeah. LeBron, Chris, we're going to see a little bit later on the show. Coming up with that guy, LeBron, make the Houston Rockets the best team in the NBA. It's next on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. We're now joined by NBA champ Antoine Walker. Antoine made wrinkles in the water yesterday when he <laughs> said Boston might be the place for LeBron to land. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. I still believe it. Now. People were calling it me. All night. Yeah. It was Man, great. Antoine still... Walker got with you yesterday. I was like, what? <laughs> it was great. I still believe it now. Um, all right. Fun conversation. It was. It was. All right. Let's keep that conversation going. Cleveland at Golden State getting ready for game one tonight. LeBron James knows he's got his work cut out for the Cavs in this one, mainly because LeBron James, well, is the Cavs. Chris Paul and the Rockets will be watching and not playing after getting bounced by Golden State, but he's still working. CP3 has already reportedly begun recruiting LeBron James to the Rockets in free agency, Antoine. Do you think, would LeBron joining the Rockets be any different than, say, Kevin Durant joining the Warriors? Ooh, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I think it's two different situations. Okay. Um, when you look at Houston's roster and what he'll be joining, um, it's not a very good roster. When you think Clint, Clint Capella is going to be gone, Trevor Reese is gonna, not going to be on the roster. Um, so Gerald Green, another guy who played big minutes for them, so they would have to fill the void. I think people got to understand when LeBron James made that move to the Miami Heat, it took them a whole year to figure out what roster and what guys to play with them. Then the complimentary yeah, players. Yeah, and then eventually Mario Chambers, Norris Cole, Shane Battier, Ray mm-hmm. Allen, Mike Chris Miller. Anders. They started yep. adding pieces around those three guys. But I don't think necessarily this is a great move for LeBron because if you look at the, the, how they play, James Harden, Chris Paul, and LeBron, it's just not a good mix. Well, Kevin Durant, well, he fit right in with Steph Curry them because they moved the ball. They were a team that get 25, 30 assists a game. Um, they mm. needed a guy who can close the game out. They didn't have to depend. They were really dependent on the three-point shot every game with Clay and Steph to get hot. Kevin Durant's a guy who can score from anywhere on the floor. So he gave them a versatility that they didn't have. I just think with Houston and LeBron going there, all those guys need the ball in their hand to be effective. James Harden has never been a guy that can spot up and shoot. Chris Paul improved his three-point shooting this year, but he still needs the ball in his hand. And LeBron is not deferring to anybody. Okay, and, he, and nobody in this league, he's going to have the ball in his hand. Yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I don't believe it's the best fit. I believe Chris Paul is doing the best thing to try to get him a championship. He would have loved to have LeBron in a sure. seven-game series. So is that for, safe to say he, he's already going back to Houston, the deal already done? Oh, I think that deal's done. Yeah, I think they did one of them NBA wink-wink type yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, see, like, see he turned down year. a big extension from the Clippers to agree to the trade to the Rockets. You don't do that unless, and you're not really supposed to do this, unless the Houston has said, hey, we got you. Like, we'll take care of it. So, yeah, yeah. I think Chris Paul's back. Yeah, and and LeBron, that's his guy. Like this is, It's not like they're trying to establish a relationship. It's like him and Dwayne Wade. They had an existing relationship. I believe there's other better fits for LeBron. I believe going to Philadelphia. Or I believe in even a total startup with the L.A. Lakers. Because I believe that, that Paul George can go there. I believe of LeBron. I don't know if Popovich is going to trade Kawhi to the Lakers or trade him in the Anywhere West. Anywhere in the West. Yeah, so I believe that Pop kind of holds that card right there. Also, that max deal, how do you turn down a max deal? But Houston, I don't believe is the best fit for LeBron because a lot of these players, how good is Chris Paul off the ball? That was our biggest question this year. Now, you're going to bring another ball handler? I believe Le- LeBron's the only one that can play off the ball and still be a superstar. And Antoine's saying he wouldn't do that. So, like, I, I know LeBron. Well, de- totally deferring to it, I believe that he's the only one capable mm-hmm. of doing that. You talked about Harden as a spot-up shooter. LeBron is not a great spot-up shooter. If you look at his three-point percentage, I'm going to get Dusty to do the numbers. How much better is he when he takes a dribble or two? He likes those diagonal threes, and he likes to put it on the ground a couple times before he raises up. So that those three right there being three ball handlers, and you mentioned Kevin Durant, Clay is a spot-up shooter. Steph can move without the ball yep. and dribbles the ball. 
What KD does is that it's third a, it part of it. It was a great complementary skill set. It yes. was great. I, I, it, we can argue about the fit of LeBron to the Rockets. But one thing, I, I want to directly answer Jenna's question. Would this be the same as Kevin Durant joining the Warriors? And when you said in the eyes of fans? In the eyes of, how about this? It, here's what I care about. In the eyes of reality. Okay. Absolutely unequivocally not. The Rockets win a championship last year, this year, anytime in the last 20 years? No. The Rockets have a 73-win team? No. Did the Rockets knock LeBron out of the playoffs in, when he was about to win a championship? Up 3-1. No. <laughs> so when people say, oh, Le well, fine, but LeBron going to Miami was the same. At, no, if LeBron had joined Boston... If Boston, who had won a title and was the reason he couldn't get to the NBA Finals, if he had joined those Hall of Famers in Boston, that would have been similar to what, and I'm talking about with the first decision, to what KD did. Like, LeBron joining the Rockets, yes, he'd be joining an MVP, but it wouldn't be a team that's already won a championship, the overwhelming dominant team in the league, and your biggest rival. Like, the, it, those are apples and bowling balls. They're, they're, they're not well, comparable. Got, and also, Nick, you got to think about this, and I agree with you on that, but the problem is you have to think about LeBron James, first of all. Him going to Houston is totally different when KD went there. When he goes to Houston, he's actually putting on that team where if, when he went to Miami, he tried to get guys to come to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that. Yes. He actually tried to get guys to come to Cleveland and say, hey, come play with me. Nobody want to live in Cleveland. I'm going to just keep it real. In right. mm -hmm. free agency, if I got a choice to go to Miami or Cleveland, I'm going to Miami. That's just how guys think. Guys want a little nightlife when they go play in the city, too. They want to be able to go to a nice restaurant. Yes. Want to be able to step out. Nice Cleveland, weather, too. Yeah, Cleveland don't offer that. So LeBron James was kind of stuck. So he went to a situation where Dwayne Wade and, and Chris Boss, he can get, get, it, get in with those guys. But I also saw a clip yesterday where they talked about winning seven, eight titles. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to Houston, is, is, is James Harden really trying to win a title? I mean, we know he wants to get there. Is that a main objective of his to win a title? Chris Paul, yes. What do you, you think this. his main objective is? The numbers, the accolades? Well, I think if, when you don't make the adjustments that he needed to make in this year's playoffs after going what he went through last year, I don't necessarily know if he's that concerned. I listen to his press oh, conference yeah. afterwards. And yeah. not saying he has to be on TV crying and, and boohooing, but it just didn't seem like a level of, like, I'm disappointed. Sure. And I'm sure he may have went home and been very disappointed around his family and friends, but... It just didn't seem right to me because when you shoot 27 threes and miss them and, and you're the best player on the floor, supposed to be one of the best players on the floor, and you don't change that, I just think you're not really making that conscious effort to be a champion. So, the, the I, well, that's, I mean, that's a, it's a hell of a statement about James Harden, who's going to win the league MVP this year. And I think a lot of people share the sentiment, which is, for some reason, there is a part of Harden that people have questioned is how important is this to him? I don't think you can get as good as he is at the difficult parts of basketball without it being incredibly important to you. No, 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 no. There's a lot of athletes out there. They're into the benefits of them being good compared to being on a team that's great. But he here's the thing. So I, I don't I, I believe you can work hard because of the individual benefits you're going to right, have. Right, but he got the biggest individual benefit you can get, which is the Supermax contract. And after that, embraced Chris Paul. After that, embraced the things that led well, to Well, he Rockets. had no chance to win in the West. Right, but I'm saying that to my, to my that's to my point, which is I do think winning's important to James Harden. Now, no, winning on the championship level, there's a, there's different levels of winning. How much will you are you willing to sacrifice? And guys, and what he's saying is the people he's been around, the superstars that he's been around, he's seen more of a sacrifice in what they're doing and in their game development to try to get that. He hadn't seen that with Harden. That's why he puts it in the and question. Think about it. You believe those guys are going to all take a back seat? Dwayne Wade was a great, you know, Robin. And then Chris Boss was efficient with 10, 11, 12 shots. Can Chris Paul be efficient with 12 shots? Can James Harden be efficient with 12 shots? We don't know. You look at the big three that they put together in OKC. All three of those guys are going to be Hall of Famers. They were a disappointment, OKC. Mm -hmm. There's no way you put those three guys on paper. If you say these three guys are going to be together, you think a championship. They, Westbrook almost won many games by himself the year before by himself. And you bring those guys on the team. So it's just it's a lot of guys' mentality. We can always say fit does matter. And mindset does matter. LeBron James has to go to a place where other guys want to win championships, understand his legacy, and want to be on that same Wayne link. And every player in the league is not on that. All right, Antoine, thanks. We're going to see you a little bit later in the show. We'll take a break. On the other side, look who's joining us. NASCAR's rising superstar, Bubba Wallace. Welcome back to First Things First. We're now joined by NASCAR's rising superstar, 
Bubba Wallace. Bubba, thank you so much for being with us. Good to see you. Thank you so thank much. You. I appreciate it. Welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. It's great appreciate to have it. you here. Thank you. So I, I got a chance to watch your uh, post-game press conference after the Daytona 500, and I was moved by how moved you were. Thank you. Uh, when you see an athlete who gets so emotional about something they just did, you, you believe how much they went through in the range of emotions. Talk to me a little bit about that. Finishing second at Daytona yeah. and then what you went through after all of it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, from, from looking back a year ago, actually I just sent out a social post of where I was at a year ago, not knowing what was next for me on my slate. Um, to drive in the 43 for a few races, to being back on the sidelines, wondering again, uh, to now being full-time in the Cup Series, um, finishing second in the Daytona 500. So all of that from last year, building up to early February, then going into that race, surviving uh, multiple wrecks that we should have been in, uh, coming out and finishing second. Um, that was uh, that was a pretty surreal moment, and uh, having my, my family there to support me was pretty cool. I, I want to talk about the 500 just for a second because I think there's a lot of people, such as myself, that are, to be totally candid, not watching NASCAR every single weekend. But you watch the Daytona 500, you mm -hmm. watch that, and you you check back in throughout the year, and then at the end of the year for the race. I. How do you avoid those wrecks? And what is going through? The, the, if people didn't watch the Daytona 500, what was it? Three? It, there were three cautions in the final 50 laps. Like it was it was insane. Yeah. Like, what's going through your mind as you're racing there? And how much of avoiding those wrecks is skill? And how much is just dumb luck? I wish I could say it's all skill. Um, but it's it's a lot of dumb you luck. Can. Yeah. You could say yeah. anything. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, you have your spotter in your ear that, that's really kind of guiding what he's seeing, but when it all comes down to it, you know, I'm the one that's behind the wheel controlling where the machine's going, and, and you, have to, you have to do everything just perfect uh, to be able to, to skate through and, and come out on the bright side. So it, it's a tough task. That's what the Speedway Racing produces. Yeah, I know you're a fan of sports. I know you're a fan of football, especially college football. Your favorite team is Tennessee. So to me, the only... It, analogy that I can really see is, man, I remember the quarterback who followed Peyton Manning mm -hmm. and driving Richard Petty's car. How did T. Martin feel when he yeah. finally led that team to a championship? Now you're driving Richard Petty's car. Do you feel that pressure in being in that car? Well, we got to look. Um, you know, the, the game of football has obviously changed in some ways, but the, the evolution of racing has changed tremendous amounts. The way the cars drive, the way they look, the way they feel. Uh, we're going probably 40 to 50 miles an hour faster mm -hmm. than, than when the king was back in his prime. So we got to look at all those factors, and, and I look at I want to set my own legacy, and, and uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for me, um, you know, for the king to be for driving for him and, and representing RPM and the, and the Petty family the best way I can. But at this day and age, it's, it's a new day, and it's a new time, so it's a new, it's a new step for me to, to start my own path. Yeah, I, I, remember, I remember talking with Tiger Woods, and Tiger Woods always talked about the pressure um, him and his dad, the pressure that Tiger was under as an African-American playing the game of golf, not a sport that people were accustomed to seeing someone. The reason why I watch NASCAR is you. I talk about you on this show you. because you being an African-American. Is there a, a sense of pressure? And, and you and your mom at the press conference, you guys embracing each other. Do you feel that pressure of fans watching the sport because you're an African-American? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I told her the, the following week after Daytona, there was there was two African American guys that come up. Uh, our, our motorhome lot, our green rooms are, are right next to the garages, and I was walking into mine, and I hear, "Hey, Bubba, you know we're here because of you." And I was like, oh, that's pretty powerful. So I called my mom right up, and I was like, this is pretty cool. So, you know, it's starting to grow. It's starting, you're starting to see more of that. But, uh, you know, I, I have enough pressure on myself of, of trying to go out there and just be the best that I can be and, and wanting to win everything and knowing that that's a really tall task and, and it's not really achievable because that's not really how racing works. You know, you're going to go through the ups and downs mm -hmm. of it. But uh, the, the African-American side, the color side of it is, is one thing that's just always going to be there until – you know, we kind of take over. So and, well, and it's interesting because you've you've obviously made the decision to embrace that part of the story. Uh, your if people follow you on Twitter, your pin tweet. So the first tweet everyone sees is from this past December, and it reads, "There's only one driver from an African American background at the top level of our sport. I am the one. You're not going to stop hearing about quote the black driver for years. Embrace it, accept it, and enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. And it also though for a guy in such a competitive sport." 
sport and a young guy, you already have the legacy of driving the King's car. Like, does it ever feel like too much is weighing on you that you're not only racing for yourself, you're you're representing a whole community, you're doing this, you're trying to break down barriers. Like, that's a lot for anybody to handle. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, you know, I look at, you know, what's realistic and, and what, what the big picture is and that's one not wrecking at 200 miles an hour um, and, and making sure we get the best finish as possible so we can better this program and hopefully one day become one of those top tier athletes in the sport so you know we have I have a lot of work to do to get to that point so there's a lot of small tasks that I look at to making that that group to follow me a lot bigger. Bubba, I watched Days of Thunder 27 times. Um, I actually have the soundtrack. I, I'm the one that bought that. Um, you're a young guy on the circuit. How much of you being out there is about you, and how much is that competing with someone else? Because once you start racing for a number of years, and I covered Dale Earnhardt, and I covered Dale Earnhardt Jr., and a lot of it, as, as Dale Earnhardt Jr. got older, was about having rivalries with other riders. But being young, just tell me what the mindset is going out there. Are you racing against yourself, or are you starting to be able to – are you creating rivalries with other guys? I mean, what's the, what's the main goal when you're out there? Uh, I'm always having run-ins with somebody, unfortunately, <laughs> but, you know, that's part of it. And, you know, it, it, for me, I'm going out I'm, – I'm, I look totally different than everybody. Uh, I'm going out and trying to, to carry that and be just different, different attitude, different vibes, you know, the more upbeat, you know, fun personality – kid that loves to loves to race and um so so being that person at the racetrack and then going out and giving it my all for you know just had the coke 600 this past weekend so for 400 laps 600 miles i'm going out there and, and putting it all on the line and 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 you cross those bridges when you get there when you run into somebody you have those those feuds and those scuffles but that's part of it that's what but the there's no one see. racer that you go out there every week saying there's right. a guy Come on. There's a, there's a guy you want to beat. What does it rhyme really with, <laughs> Bubba? What does it rhyme with? Give us initials. Just initials. I'm trying to think of, you know, who's the top guy? You know, who's that one guy? I can't think of anybody. I want to beat everybody. Good. Okay. Successful uh, one all beat. right. You mentioned the Coca-Cola 600. Mm -hmm. People, again, that's 600 miles yes. you're, you're racing. <laughs> I don't think people have an idea of how physically exhausting mm -hmm. being a race car driver oh, yeah. is. What great shape you have to be to be a race car driver. Can you ex describe as best you can to the audience what you feel like after that race, what you feel like after just any NASCAR race for that matter? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously dehydrated. Um, your legs are kind of locked up. I mean, you're sitting there for four, four and a half hours uh, in that same position the whole time. Uh, so legs were definitely locked up. I, I posted a tweet. I looked like a, a, a newborn giraffe trying to, trying to walk. <laughs> so... Uh, you, you definitely are feeling fatigued and you, you don't want to, you just want to kind of lay down on the ground. You know, I see you've seen some guys. How many times you use the bathroom, man? I don't. You can't, I can't bring myself to it in the car. What so, do you, how do you so you're still a virgin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> I am. He doesn't believe, I don't think Chris <laughs> believes you. Well, wait, no. it, Four and a half hours, you, you could sweat it out. Adrenaline takes over. Some guys. No, do you it. had to use the bathroom. I you did, you I decided not. not to. Yet. I did not. I, I, I have before, and I can't bring myself to it. Because the rule is, you have to be there Monday morning, 6 a.m., when the shop door is open to go clean it out. I don't want to clean it out. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? Who sets oh. those rules? That's Who's like the, the that's like the. No, that's what they yeah. told you because you're that, young. Yeah. Trust me, that is not the rule. You think but Jimmy Johnson a, been cleaning it out? All the, Tony all Stewart's cleaning out his yeah. car. I don't know about well, that. I think once you get to a higher level, yeah. But I have enough respect for my guys. But there's, oh, they're, wow. they're also saying, oh, Jenna's going to gonna get some. We got a staff of 12 here, 11 of them. Jenna, we got, somebody got PP duty. <laughs> Bubba, you're a star, man. You don't have a guy that's wanting to low in the ranks, wants to come up? Nah. Hey, bro, let Bubba, let me hold your suit on Monday. Because I know Nick's got two guys, uh, Dusty, Deontay, and them. They would be there for him on Monday. <laughs> Now, you don't have a guy? No, we, I do, but I look out for him. We look oh, out for yeah, yeah. You're a good look boss, man. Yeah, yeah. You're a good boss. You are a lot of fun, and you've got a great spirit and personality. Thank we you. really look forward to watching you grow in the sport Thank and you. watching you take over the sport. It's nice. It's really nice to see, and we love having you here Also, show. look for Thank your you. Facebook doc series, yeah. Behind the Wall. That's Make right. sure you tune into that if you're a fan yeah. of Bubba Wallace. Please Make do. sure you take a look at that. Bubba, Please come do. visit us again. We'd love to have you. This was a lot of fun. We're going to take a break. Yeah, I want to win. This. Time for some stories to start your morning. NBA Finals Game 1 is tonight. Finally, that guy right there, Andre Iguodala's leg contusion has not improved, and the former Finals MVP will not be on the floor, though he says he's not that far away.
Chris, how big of a blow is this for the Golden State Warriors? No, not unless they're going to get some all-star team from the Eastern Conference to show up for tonight's game. It's not a big blow. They got through the toughest series that they've had um, in the last several years, absent the 2016 when they lost to the Cavs. So, no, they're not going to miss it. Iggy, they got plenty of talent. I, the, the, the Warriors are do, trying to do some weird Jedi mind trick on all of us. The Cavs have a bunch of great players, and man, without Iggy, what are we going to do? Yeah. Uh, woe is us and our just four in their prime Hall of Famers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no everyone, team could make it with one guy. Everyone would love that to team. be fully healthy, <laughs> right? Everybody would love that. And the Cavs would love to still have Kyrie Irving. So I think the Warriors will be all right. Moving on, <laughs> many agree that LeBron James carried a subpar Cavs supporting yeah. cast to the NBA Finals, but don't ask Warriors head coach Steve Furr. It's Kerr, what is it, the Jedi? Steve, I don't know. I was You're more concerned about the Steve Kerr part. <laughs> Steve Kerr got fur. <laughs> Steve Kerr said, quote, we know what these guys can do. You don't get to the finals with one man, no matter how good that one man is. Nick, I read all those words correctly. You what did. are your thoughts on Kerr first comments? I mean, the, I guess I spoiled them all with my previous comments. It's nonsense. Like, they, they, LeBron averaged 34 points a game in these playoffs. No one else is averaging even 14 points a game. That's a 20-point discrepancy. The largest since Wilt made the finals, and I don't even know the dude on Wilt's team who averaged 20 less than him. So come on now, Steve Kerr. You know better than this. I didn't think, Nick, it would ever affect our business because I thought we were just beyond this. But, man, we starting to get some fake news up in our business. <laughs> no. We got it. That's Steve Kerr. Stop, man. Like, 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 stop. We haven't seen a team with being one-dimensional like this team in a long time. All right, let's talk some golf. Tiger Woods is back on the course. He tees off at the Memorial Tournament in Dublin, Ohio at 8.26 a.m. on the dot. CC, what are your thoughts on Dublin, Ohio, and what do you expect from Tiger? Oh, it's one of my favorite golf courses. Of course, Jack Nicklaus, he's an alumni of the great Ohio, Ohio State, State University. The greatest golfer ever. That's what this is Jack's place. It's like Augusta in Columbus, Ohio. Beautiful golf course. How do you play it well? You got to hit the fairways. The greens are immaculate, very, very um, tough to read, a lot of undulation. But if you get in that rough, man, that Ohio grass in the summertime, it can be tough for you. So look for Tiger Woods. This is one of his favorite tournaments, one of his favorite golf courses. Arnie's tournament, look how many times he's won it. Jack's tournament, look how many times he's won it because he gets fired up to play for the greats. I just want to see Tiger continue the momentum from the great weekend he had at the players when from the Saturday round to the front nine on Sunday, he had the best 27-hole stretch we've seen in this version of the comeback. And to off my cap to one Chris Carter, who had the opportunity to miss a couple days of work, Dang. go play in the Pro-Am, maybe play, maybe hang out with Tiger. I don't know. They got a little relationship, decided to come to work, unlike these guys. Tiger shoots 67 the day to get started. All Five right, let's ball. do it. It's a good sign. On to the NFL. Le'Veon Bell isn't the only big-time star causing issues at OTAs. The other two members of the Steelers trio we're also not in attendance. Ben Roethlisberger attended the first day and hasn't been there since. And Antonio Brown made it to day two before taking leave. Cece, what are your thoughts on Ben and Brown's big absence? Oh, this is normal for the Pittsburgh Steelers. This is the type of coach man Jenny always talked about. Different families have different rules <laughs> where the dysfunction in Pittsburgh is at a high level. Now, they're still a good team. I think this prevents them from winning multiple Super Bowls with this group together. Now, Antonio, I can vouch for him. I know his trainer. I know who the guy who's his therapist. No one in the league works harder than him. Big Ben, I look at his face and his physique. <laughs> I know there's no one bigger at the quarterback position than Ben, okay? <laughs> so, Ben, I'm concerned about, especially with the younger players, what they see and how it sets a double standard for the rest of the roster. I usually don't mind if guys miss OTAs. They're voluntary for a reason. But Antonio spoke out a turn about L. Bell not being there, and then he stopped showing up. Big Ben said talked way sideways about Mason Rudolph and then yeah. said, no, 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 I'm still going to help him along for a day before I go hit happy hour or wherever Ben's at right now. Golfing. So I just, golfing, I just, I think he should have, I think both those guys should be there given what they said. All right, finally, we have Kobe. He visited the Pats yesterday for OTAs in Foxborough. Kobe Bryant spent time at the Patriots practice facility in the team meeting room, took some pictures, some of the players. So you see, what's it like when a Big time sporting legend comes to visit your team. Man, I love things like this because, man, we talk about how boring, how mundane the, the, the New England Patriots can be in their day-to-day -day regiment. Man, they need things like this. 
And this is where a coach like Bill Belichick, he realizes that, wow, let me get someone in there who has a championship attitude. And very seldom do you see a coach, a coach like Belichick, he's going to trust the speaker to take up time that he would typically be speaking to the players. So having someone like Kobe, it's really, really important. You see someone, Nick Saban does this all the time. I believe he's the best in the business at it, is bringing in profound speakers, people that have been successful at a lot of different things so that the players, they kind of hear the same thing coming from a different messenger. So Nick Saban, he trusts the speakers and being famous to be able to do the right thing a, a lot in front of his players more than I've seen any coach. Belichick needs these types of things because he has the type of message that if you keep hearing it and hearing it and hearing it, you can be a little bit tone deaf to what he's saying. Kobe and Belichick have a lot of the same principles. What about when you were playing? Do you recall any athletes coming in, any stars? I mean, I was in, very, very, legends? I was very, very fortunate that I had Dennis Green. I ain't need no Kobe Bryant because Dennis Green, he dropped wisdom on us from Bill Walsh, Mike Holmgren, a lot of Andy Reid. All of them kind of grew up on the same coaching staff. So Dennis Green, yes, we did have some outside speakers, and also with my brother growing up in the NBA. Like I've had Magic Johnson talk to me, Isaiah Thomas, Kareem. Abdul Jabbar, so I've had a lot of them personally been able to take time and be able to help me out. Flip side of that question, what's the favorite for you when you've been in the Kobe role? When you've gone and talked to a team, when you've gone and done something, when you've been the guy brought in from the outside, whether it was high school team or college team or whatever it is? Yeah, I think going back to Ohio State when they play Michigan and um, and Urban Meyer trusting me to be able to come up with something to be able to say in those moments, which I know before that type of game, man, you're just looking for a little something, a little something to give you an edge. I would say going back to Ohio State, speaking before the Michigan game, would probably be the biggest moment. I mean, I've had a lot of moments, man. But that's, but that's uh, yes. an important one. Yes. Especially with the... Yeah, I think the trust. Because you know how big it is for the players, that the, that the coach is trusting you that you could have something that would add to what he's already said. What about the, when we huddle up every morning? Oh, when we on. all huddle up like this every morning, you give us that, the nuggets of wisdom before it's we come out here? It's not always inspirational. No, but it's, Sometimes, it's nuggets. It, you ever heard the thing, you got to know when, you're, when your team needs the, the whip or the sugar cube? Right. Cece doesn't subscribe so much to the, to the sugar, sugar cube, cube portion of that. But it's See, good. The, look, the, how, look at us. We get along. We, we, we bring it every day. Because Just like Michigan, Ohio State, you. right? See? Same yeah. thing. Yeah, full disclosure. I come into Jenna's office what? around 5 o'clock, uh -oh. and I get out my my <laughs> pump, and I pump that thing up. Let's what go, Jenna. <laughs> Let's go. About. Let's do this thing, it Jenna. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Couldn't be. I'm yeah. fired up in the yeah. morning. Nick, I have to tone him down. <laughs> yeah, off the black coffee. Please. Bro. Off the call. Black coffee, black and white. Jenna up, Nick Dan. That is not true. Cavs and Warriors, <laughs> Warriors and Cavs, Einhorn, Finkel, Finkel, Einhorn. No matter how you say it, it's been the NBA Finals matchup four years in a row. And despite sports fans craving incredible rivalries, Celtics, Lakers, Lakers, Celtics, many are reportedly growing weary of this matchup. Well, LeBron has something to say about that. Teams have had their opportunities to beat. The Cavs over the last four years and teams have had opportunities to beat the Warriors over the last four years. And if you want to see somebody else in the postseason, then, then you got to beat them. The best NBA has got to get better. It's not our fault. All right, what do you make of LeBron and Clay's comments? All right, I, I agree with them in part. The, the reason I think people probably rubbed a little more poorly by Clay's than LeBron's is because the team that was closest to beating the Warriors to prevent the Warriors from going to a bunch of these finals, the Warriors went and poached that team's best player and kneecapped that team in Oklahoma City. But it is what it is. Nobody's been able to beat LeBron in this conference in nearly a decade. In, in the East, no matter what team he's been on and no matter who his teammates are. And this is why this is intriguing to me. The first finals... Warriors Cavs the best teammate LeBron had in those finals ended up being Della Vadova the next two finals the best teammate was Kyrie Irving this year we got no clue <laughs> the best teammate we think's Kevin Love but he was concussed and Jeff Green actually played better than Love had been playing so it's been very different versions of Cavs teams from each finals from the first version versions two and three and then this version and as you mentioned earlier see for the Warriors 
It's two different teams. Yes. It's the pre-KD team mm -hmm. and the post-KD team. So while the names on the jerseys are the same, they are very different teams because of the roster turnover Cleveland's had and because of the singular addition Golden State's had. I mean, both of these runs, though, will be epic as far as NBA history. When we look back on NBA history, we'll look at these four years and be like, wow, Le LeBron. Oh, he went back to Cleveland. For people who won't know the whole story, been like, well, what happened? The kid was born there, and then what? Then they got the first pick, and then he left? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he went to Miami and won a couple championships, and, then he, and he came back? I mean, LeBron's side of the story is, is a fairy tale. Like, that didn't turn up to be a nightmare. He went back and delivered on the letter, on the promise. So, wow, how could that not be a great story? The Warriors were one of the greatest collection of basketball team players that we had seen. And then they went out and added Kevin Durant. The, both of them epic as far as NBA history. So, Clay is right. If you want to beat us, you're going to have to get better. Everyone's been gunning for LeBron since he was a kid. So, like, get better. Eastern Conference, the Celtics thought they got better. They had some injuries. A couple years ago, the Hawks thought they were better. Man, Toronto is doing everything that they can. They didn't fire the coach. They've been trying to get better, but no one's been able to do it. Both of these stories are very standalone by themselves. Sure. Are great and to epic stories. But together, would we like this rivalry more if there was maybe if the Warriors weren't as good well, and if the it, Cavs were a little bit better? Here's the thing, and no one was saying this, I don't think, about last year's finals. People wanted to see part three. Now, people thought the Warriors were heavily favored, but the Cavs had just won. They still had Kyrie Irving. They were healthy, and people were excited for it. The only reason this narrative is coming out is because we've seen how much Cleveland has struggled, that LeBron is playing the best basketball of his career, and it nearly wasn't enough to get out of round one against Indiana. It nearly wasn't enough to get out of round three against Boston, mm -hmm. who was missing its two stars. Like, you know what it's going to take America to get into this series if people aren't? And by the way, people say they're not into it. It's going to be one of the highest rated NBA finals ever, at least in the beginning. What it will take America to get into this series is Cleveland winning one of these first Oh, I thought you were going to say earlier start time. Like, no, no. The, the start time's fine. <laughs> it's it's Cleveland. If, if, they're, if at some point it's like, hold on, could LeBron do this? Then all of a sudden people will be pulled in much more so, by the way, than if it's could LeBron beat Houston or could he beat the Pelicans? Like the intrigue of could he do this will be high drama if it exists. The concern people have is these are going to be 20-point games. Yes, and, and not having Kyrie in the fourth one, it takes, some, it, it takes some of the shine off of what we're going to see. Kyrie not being healthy in the first one. It took something mm -hmm. off of, of this being an epic series. Them adding Durant, we had to see number three. And everyone everyone this year had their best shot. Cleveland was the fourth seed. Almost locked in, lost in round one. And I had them as an underdog in round two. And then Eastern Conference, Conference Finals. They earned a spot. And, even though they're not a great team, they earned a well, spot in the finals. And I would ask America this, all right? They, I, I've listened for the last... Four years. We have a few people watching how much, the islands and everything. Okay, our American everywhere also, our friends in Trinidad. Yes. The, I, I would ask uh, the viewing audience this. I've, I've listened for four years. People don't like watching Maury Ball and James Harden draw fouls. I've listened that the Rockets style of basketball is aesthetically not pleasing. So are, did you want them to make the NBA Finals? And out east, let's assume the Warriors make it out west. You, you were excited for Victor Oladipo's Pacers to get there. You were excited for the Toronto Raptors to be there. That, that, that would have jazzed you up. You were excited for the Celtics without their two best players to be there. Or are you really deep down, you want to see if LeBron can do it. You want to well, see what it's going can, to look like. Can I like. just say this? Why is it, and just hold on a second before you jump, why is it so far-fetched to think LeBron James can't do this one other thing? He's done everything else. He has taken a team of misfits, if you will, to the NBA Finals, where no one thought, nobody thought they were going to get out of almost any of the rounds except what they did with Toronto. He keeps surprising us time after time after time. The numbers, the statistics, the records, he's breaking all of them, where we're just sort of, oh, there's no way he's going to do this. Is it that far-fetched for us to think that maybe this could be the craziest of all the yeah. things he does? Go ahead, see, or if it were a one-game sample, no. If it were a best of three, no. Best of five, maybe. But for a guy that is this undermanned 
to win a best of seven. We saw the Giants beat the Patriots. The Giants wouldn't beat the Patriots in four out of seven. Give me a br We saw Team USA beat the Russians. They ain't winning no best of seven. Okay, that one I'll give you. Know you know what I like? They're, they got no shot. So, like, the, and I'm not in. People can say, oh, how can a team with LeBron be that yeah. heavy of an underdog? Because you do got to run five guys out there. It's not, it's, not, it's not king of the hill where it's just one-on-one-on-one-on-one. On one on one on one. And gotta, this is not the NBA 20 years ago, 10 years ago, nor 30 years ago. With one guy, you could, you could win a championship in the NBA. But that was before the, 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 the analytics, the three-point shooting, and also the creating the super teams. Like, so that, it, that, that, that's totally out. I mean, this would be, I can't. I, in a series, it'd be the biggest upset in my sports life. It's just because you got to win four times. You got to win four times, and shooting the three ball is so important. And they have three of the best shooters at all on one team. So, it, it to me, I think it would be the biggest upset of our lifetime. I can't believe you guys think Cleveland's going to win. <laughs> Crazy! Uh, coming up, is there an under the radar MVP candidate in the NFL? It's a joke. Was, was well, I wasn't sure. Funny. I wasn't sure. It's next on First Things First. <laughs> Sticking with the Texans, <laughs> wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins caught an NFL high 13 touchdowns last season, seven of them from rookie Deshaun Watson, who became the first quarterback to throw for 19 touchdowns in his first seven games. Watson's season ended early with that devastating torn ACL, but as far as Watson's second year, Hopkins can't help but be excited. It gives me chills sometimes just to think what we did and the little time we had together. Uh, you know, but, but seeing him mature, uh, not just on the field, but off the field, you know, I can't wait. Honestly, you know, I feel like I, I set the standard high for, for myself and him. Um, so, you know, I think we can be the best in this league. Uh, I think he can be the best quarterback. I know I can be the best wide receiver. Uh, and that's our mindset coming into the season. All right, let's talk Watson and Hopkins, Chris. Well, how, how lethal a duo can these two be on this Texans team? I think they can be as good of a quarterback-receiver combo as we have in the National Football League. And okay. when I'm talking about Deshaun Watson, I know it's a small sample size, only six starts, but you can make an argument for a four-game stretch. He was the most dynamic player in the NFL, what he was capable of doing. Just you talk about how he's elevated that offense in their production in terms of being able to score points or averaging around 35 points a game. But then when you look at the different aspects of the offense that improve when Deshaun Watson is under center, their running game is off the charts. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that people don't pay enough attention to. When you're able to control time of possession in football games by being able to run the ball, that completely takes pressure off of everyone around your football team. It takes pressure off of the wide receivers. It takes pressure off of your offensive line and pass protection. Most importantly, it takes pressure off of your defense. So if you have an offense that can score a lot of points and then offensively you're controlling time of possession, that's going to make opposing teams one-dimensional on offense. And with the talent that they have coming back for that Houston Texans defense, that could be a scary combination. Listen, what Deshaun Watson did last year was nothing short of a miracle. This team, their only quality offensive lineman above average going into the year was the left tackle. He held out, never played for him. Without Deshaun Watson, before he got in the lineup, then after he left the lineup, this team averaged 13 points a game. 13. With him, they averaged 35. Like, so, same offensive lineman, same skill position guys. Mm -hmm. He was, forget a force multiplier, he was exponential multiplier yep. for them. I, and for the receiver, though, Deshaun Watson, Deshaun Watson, pardon me, DeAndre Hopkins, Nuke Hopkins, some of the best hands in football, one of the most talented guys in the league, a guy that has had three separate 1,200-yard seasons, despite, I'll do it quickly, these are quarterbacks we've thrown to him. Schaub, Keenum, Yates, Fitzpatrick, Mallett, Savage, Hoyer, Whedon, Daniels. Not sure what Daniels that is. It ain't Chase. Osweiler, Deshaun Watson, and Heineck Hineke, Taylor Hineke. Those are the quarterbacks he's had in his five years in the league. No receiver has had to deal with a worse quarterback situation than him, and he has been productive despite that. I mean, I think this combo could be deadly. Yeah, I remember before we got Warren Moon, um, I had went through a very similar situation uh, as DeAndre went through. Got Warren Moon, broke the NFL record, 122 catches, seven touchdowns. Following year, was so excited. We, now, we had the whole season, so not like them. They got robbed of most of the season. Then the next year, Warren and I came back. We just talked about the things we were going to be able to do. 
how do we duplicate what we did? Warren was like, we're going to be better, Chris. I was like, how are we going to be better? He said, man, because I'm going to get you back on the touchdown track in the red zone. I missed you a lot last year. You and I are going to be more in sync. Next year, 122 passes again, same number, 17 touchdowns compared to seven. So, yes, the chemistry becomes very, very important. As a wide receiver, you're still at the mercy of how talented is the thrower. And those throwers that you had talking about, Nick, not nearly the talent that Deshaun Watson has. Also, you got Will Fuller on the other side, a phenomenal young receiver who has the skill set that is complementary to Nuke on the other side. A couple things with Nuke we saw in his highlights. He got a lot better running with the football after the catch last year. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking for Bill O'Brien. He's got to be able to come up with some things to be able to protect the quarterback because we only got a seven-game sample now. Mm-hmm. I need to see more of that before I put him in that elite status as far as quarterbacks. We've seen a lot of quarterbacks do it for a short period of time. But I need Bill O'Brien to make sure they protect him with that offensive line. Also give him a running game, all right, that they haven't had there for the Texans. And the guy getting the honorary degree, yeah. I need to see some football out of you. Okay? Yeah. Enough, been, J.J. Watt. It's okay? been a couple years. Yeah, I, yeah it's, it's, you've been on a two-year bye. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I need to see him in Clowney because if they can generate the type of rush and turnovers, it only helps that offense. So sure. if they're a top 10 defense, oh, my goodness. The, 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 what they can do offensively, I believe, can be real, real special. I completely agree, CC. People want to look at what this Texans offensive rushing output was when Deshaun Watson was the quarterback. They averaged 145 yards a game. Now, mm-hmm. in comparison, the Jacksonville Jaguars, who led the league in rushing, they averaged 141 yards a game. So that yes. shows you how talented and without and it, how they good. were at less than 100. And that's what I'm saying. So yep. mm-hmm. exactly, in every start he was in, they had, they had over 100 yards rushing. So that's that's an aspect of this thing that you have to look at, and you have to say, well, how does this impact our football team? You were talking about that defense and how some of those guys coming back from injury need to be better. If you can make opposing teams more one-dimensional with the offense being able to run the ball and score lot of points they should be able to dictate the scores and how the game is played then those pass rushers they're a lot better when they know it's passed jj watt whitney whitney merciless mm-hmm. Jadavion Clowney, they should be able to get after it but that's the impact of having a quarterback the caliber of deshaun watson that's what they bring to the table just like what we saw with carson wentz in his second year i'm looking for mm. the same type of production okay. for deshaun watson here's my question to you why are we so much more excited about deshaun watson and his in, in how successful it was in a short period of time than we are about, say, Jimmy Garoppolo in his short period oh, of time that he played. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, if Deshaun Watson was on – if they if Houston called someone and said, hey, do you want Deshaun Watson? People would give you a couple first-round draft picks. He was dominant in college football. Not a year, two years. That's he it. is a freak athlete. He can run. He can throw the ball anywhere. And he's a great leader. I mean, at Clemson, with the type of talent, I mean, he's a leader of grown folks. So mm-hmm. all those things, he's better than Jimmy Garoppolo at. And if, De- if Deshaun Watson was in, in New England, oh, they would have never traded him. He would still be there waiting on Tom Brady. Well, and the let's the, the, the let's be fair with the Jimmy Garoppolo situation. He had five starts. They went five and zero, but he also had seven touchdowns to five interceptions in those five starts. The team, the Texans, were as more abundant as the Niners with and without their quarterback as they were. But Deshaun went 19 touchdowns, eight picks. And also, Jimmy G, people are excited enough to make him for a short period of time, highest paid quarterback in the NFL. Mm -hmm. But it's the Clemson part of it. It is watching, I watched Deshaun Watson in back to back national championship games against Alabama. Against guys that play on Sundays. Be the best player on the field. Mm -hmm. Just dominate these guys. So that's one of the reasons why we have seen half-season or quarter-season samples of guys be amazing and then regress significantly the next year, very rarely is a guy who coming out of college, you're like, man, this guy is an absolute stud who I thought would have been in the discussion for number one overall pick if people weren't concerned about the mobile quarterback stuff Mm -hmm. that, that got attached to him. Well, durability was also a concern because he had a couple of major knee injuries before he came into the NFL, and obviously those concerns were warranted because he's dealing with this situation now. But after you go through an ACL injury, you know what the rehab process is going to be like. That's just going to give you an advantage going through it again. So I think we can trust the Houston Texans and the medical staff and the coaching staff. They're going to bring him along according to the proper timeline that's in his best interest. And you got to believe in Bill O'Brien and his staff in terms of getting Deshaun Watson 
up to speed in terms of the cerebral part of the game and having him make that leap from year one to year two because that's when you see the biggest growth in any player in the NFL, but especially at the quarterback position. So that's why I look at what we saw from Deshaun Watson and I say it can be comparable to what we saw from Carson Wentz in the first 12, 13 games of this season. Yeah, let's trust what Dabo Sweeney said, one of the best coaches in college football. Now, he, he, he had a little yeast on it. Mm -hmm. He said he's Michael Jordan. He did say that. And people, you know, they were taken back by that. But, man, he, he's definitely a superstar in the making. He had what on it? A little yeast. Yeast. Makes it, it, makes, grow. it, it, make the, it make the bread go up. Nice. Okay. <laughs> in that sense, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Chris, thanks so much. As always, we're hanging with us. She doesn't do carbs. She doesn't I, I didn't know what right you were saying. Coming up, sugar free yeast. What's the one sliver of hope for LeBron and the Cavs tonight in game one? The answer next. Share that with your girl. Welcome back to First Things First. Antoine Walker's back with us, gearing up for the big game the big tonight. Game. Yeah. Getting excited. It's been a great season. It's yeah, really I'm been a drama it. soap operatic season, would you not say, in the NBA this year? Very much so. But the, the four teams we thought were going to be, you know, in the East and West yep. were there, mm -hmm. and the two teams we thought would be in the finals are there. So, so we could have just skipped the whole season. We could have skipped the whole season, thing. But. And I'll meet you in June <laughs> next year. Hey, if you're a fan of the same two teams, as Antoine said, playing four straight times, then this year's NBA Finals is for you. Cavs and Warriors tip off tonight for the fourth straight year. And while the bulk of the Warriors remain the same from years past, the Cavs team is clearly not as deep, not as talented as the last few years. But Cleveland still has LeBron James, and LeBron James has proven he could single-handedly win games. Also, he kind of likes this challenge. Listen, Golden State is one of the best teams I've ever played. It's one of the best teams that's ever been assembled. Um, you know, um, and then, and then they added Kevin Durant. So what then? What does that do to him? It even makes him even more dangerous and, um, you know, even more powerful and great. And you know, and it's just um, it, it's for me as a competitor. It's just it's fun. It's it's very it's truly fun. And um, to 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 know when I'm done playing a game of basketball, to know I played against some of the greatest teams that ever played. Um, you know, you know, ever been assembled. Um, and this is one of them. All right, Antoine, besides have fun, which LeBron <laughs> is very excited about, because that's probably all it's going to take. What do the Cavs need to do to have any chance in game one tonight? Can you break down even specifically something they can do to give themselves a shot? One, you got to try to win this game one. I think this, this first game tonight is so important. Um, LeBron James has to be aggressive. We saw in the past throughout this playoffs, the first game, he hasn't been a dominant player in the first game, and it takes a while for him to get going, usually waste the game too. He has to be aggressive. I'm looking for like a 35-shot night from him. You know, maybe 35 put up, shots. Yeah, yeah, just okay. got to be aggressive mm -hmm. off the bat. He cannot, he cannot wait, no forward to wait on these guys to come. They got to, they got to just come as they, as he gets going. They got hope they come along, and then obviously you're gonna have to get multiple guys in double figures. I'm not saying you got to have 20, but he needs J.R. Smith. He can't have Goose Egg. You got to have 10 or 15 from him. George Hill needs 10 or 15 from him. What if Kevin Love doesn't play? So you're gonna need. Three, two to three other guys in double figures and control the pace of the game. LeBron James has to control it. This is a 45-minute to 48-minute game that he's going to have to play. You don't play again this Sunday. Mm -hmm. I'm going all out. Try to steal game one. Andre Iguodala's not playing. A guy who's defended me um, throughout the series and had some success. But, I mean, LeBron numbers have been unbelievable in the finals. So, right. I don't know how much success you want to call it. But he's had some success guarding. So, now you force Draymond Green, who you guy you can get in foul trouble, who... Kevin Durant's going to have to play some D. And then they got to even go down their bench and play Jordan Bell on LeBron. Those are probably be if the If you three get them in foul trouble, trouble. Mm -hmm. yep. they got to go down. So they're going to miss Andre Iguodala in that, in that sense. But if I'm, I'm LeBron James, I'm trying to get 45 to 50 points tonight. So here's the – I mean, that – and that is, by the way, he – LeBron's either going to have to have 40-plus or mid-30s with a triple-double. Like, that is, the, that is for the Cavs to compete – that, that's the talent discrepancy. When you're talking about guys for the Cavs contributing, here is something that I don't know why no one has mentioned, but it needs to be discussed. The most reliable supporting cast member for LeBron these playoffs has been Kyle Korver. The Cavs deemed Kyle Korver unplayable in last year's NBA Finals. He barely got off the bench because they thought against this Warriors team, there was nowhere to hide him defensively. Korver getting a year older didn't make him a better defensive player, but now they have to play him, right? Like, they got no choice mm -hmm. but to play Kyle Korver. So, 
Are they able to play Kyle Korver? Or even if he's hitting shots, is he giving up as many points on the other end? You said we don't know if Kevin Love's playing. They obviously need Kevin Love to play. But the most important thing I think you said was control the pace. We saw a bit of a blueprint for how an undermanned, under-talented Cavs team can compete with the Warriors. Granted, that was pre-KD, which is a huge yeah, but. And that was in 2015, where LeBron was taking 30-plus shots, where they were grinding the clock out, where they were trying to constrict the number of possessions. I think that has to be the exact model this game, where LeBron is the one bringing the ball up the court, where they're not even getting into it till there's eight on the shot clock, and it's either a LeBron shot, LeBron drive, or LeBron driving kick as the shot clock's expiring. I, Jen, I like the question, and I like how you said specifically. How would they win game number one? There would be a few things that would have to happen. The number one thing that has to happen, especially early, is they got to turn them over. They got to create between 16 to 20 turnovers. Now we know Golden State can be a little careless with the basketball, especially early in the games. One of the things that Houston took advantage of. The other thing is, Antoine, man, you got to make this ugly. When you got a team that has more talent than me, this is what I got to do. I got to bloody your nose, Nick. I got to play basketball the way I play, play basketball. Yeah. Nick, yeah. yeah, Nick. And Nick's like, I, I, I got to be on your team, Chris, because mm-hmm. you're yeah. a little too physical yeah. for me. And when you are down in talent, when you are down, because you, you can't put on the board as a coach, you can't put luck. Hey, good, hey guys, this is what we're going to rely on tonight. Luck. No, you got to turn them over. You got to make the game ugly. You got to get in their face. You got to potentially get a technical, potentially have someone kicked out of the game because that's the way when you're when you don't have the talent of the other people. The other thing, Nick, is I got to disagree with you on the running part. There's two instances where I want the Cavs to run and only those two. If you turn them over. Yes. Agree. Run the ball. And if, uh, yeah. if you run, and also, if there are certain opportunities during the game where LeBron rebounds the ball, I want LeBron to go on the fast break. If he don't have the numbers, then to pull it out because Golden State is a top five defensive team. I think, you know, we are, we're talking about the offense and need other guys to step up to help LeBron score. But the other thing we are talking about is defensively. This is not the same team. In the past years, Cleveland, they've had some other guys that play defense. Mm-hmm. I think about being able to go small and play Richard Jefferson the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Amon Shumpert, been on the team, yes. been able to play a guy like that. Even with Matthew Del Vidova, Del Vidova. He, was a, he was a defensive guy. So they've had other guys in, the, in, in years past to defend. This team, you got to worry about, are you going to take a, a page out of Houston book? If I'm, I'm T. Lou, I'm switching everything, one through five. I'm going to take a page out of it. I'm not going to try to show on the high pick and roll and get back. And I'm going to switch everything and force them to go one-on-one, take them out their normal rhythm of pass and everything. So you got to do something different that they haven't seen from, before from Cleveland. Are we all just assuming that LeBron's going to have to play all the minutes, all the games in this series? Gotta and play. is that possible? They, listen, the, you mentioned it, right? They have two days off between every game except yes. for games three and four. So he's got to play, yes. what, what would you say, 45 minutes a night? Oh, without question. You need him on the floor, even if he's a decoy. I mean, you're going to have to have them on the floor. Now, T. Lou's going to have to go down his bench, and you, it's a reason why you got these young guys. Are you confident in playing Larry Nance, Jordan Clarkson, and Rodney Hood, a guy you went away from? You may have to play him. He's had success playing against Western Conference teams. He knows how to play against them. Mm, you may have to play him over Kyle Corbin because yeah. he may give you a little bit more defensively. So you got you to be creative. And I, I like the fact what CC said about making the physical. Who's going to step up and... Goon it up. Yeah, Tristan Thompson. Get into it Sorry, with Draymond yes. Green. Yes. Why not? You know, see if you can get him out of control. You know, mm-hmm. get into it with Kevin Durant. Start Kendrick Perkins. Have yeah. him just punch somebody. And, but the biggest mismatch <laughs> of the series is Kevin Durant. Cleveland don't have enough bodies. Mm-hmm. You know, and they were, last year they was able, and the year before, yeah. put Richard Jefferson, give LeBron a little bit of a break where he didn't have to guard him. They have nobody on their roster that they can put they traded, besides they Jeff They Green. traded for Jay Crowder for that purpose, and Jay Crowder's on the team. 